Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar hosted by the Migration in Harmony Research Coordination Network, uh, which is led by myself, Victoria Herman, um, my co-principal investigators, Dr. Chad Briggs at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and Dr. Elizabeth Ferris at Georgetown University. And our network, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, aims to bring together everyone working on different migrations along Arctic coastlines, species migrations, econ economic migrations, human displacement, ecosystem range shifts, practitioners, public health specialists, local decision makers, traditional knowledge holders, all together to make more informed decisions about how to support a just, equitable, and sustainable Arctic as we see more motion catalyzed by climate change, urbanization, and globalization. Today's webinar will feature the amazing Dr. Marcy Rockman. We are going to hear from Marcy for the first part of this webinar. And Dr. Marcy Rockman is quite frankly, a rock star. Uh, she is trained as an archaeologist, geologist, but from 2011 to 2018, she served with the U.S. National Park Service as the climate change adaptation coordinator for cultural resources. Today, she works with ECOMOS, the International Council for Monuments and Sites, on projects to better integrate cultural heritage into international climate response. So including cultural heritage in things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, and she also works with the nonprofit organization CoEqual to help provide climate research to the US Congress. In today's webinar, she'll be sharing some of her most recent work, some big ideas for how to ensure cultural heritage is not only included, but is leading our climate policy and our climate responses. I will be muting myself, but I will be monitoring the chat throughout Marcy's presentation. If you have any questions for Marcy, or if you have logistical questions, please put them in the chat throughout her presentation. I will be monitoring and collecting questions there. We'll then move into an open question and answer session where I will be moderating anyone who wants to come on and ask their question on the phone or on video. Or if you don't have a great connection, I will be reading your questions to Marcy. Everyone if you say. have to leave early, that's not a problem. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it to YouTube later today and sending out the link. So you won't I'm miss anything. Right now, so I, can't I think talk. that is all for me. So without further ado, Marcy, take it away. Right, a whole page about yesterday. I just saw the note come up it's asking folks to mute because I was hearing someone's conversation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Victoria, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for that lovely introduction. Um, I've also been watching where you are all from. Um, I've been to many of the places you are from, luckily, and I wish I could visit many of the places that you currently are. I am joining this webinar from Washington, D.C. Um, I live about a mile from the Capitol building. So um, as Victoria uh, was saying, I will be talking about cultural heritage, climate change and policy. Let me get my slide up there. Um, and it is, uh, it is true to say that when you are in Washington DC, it's like policy is in the air. So I will try to share that. What I am going to do, as Victoria said, is I will be talking about cultural heritage, climate change, and policy, and I'm going to use migration as um, one of our connecting pieces. And I think perhaps one of the best ways to do this is to start with a story. So I'm going to jump right in. Stories, our story begins, my story begins in 1606, when the Virginia Company of London was founded with a plan to establish settlements in North America. The Jamestown colony, shown here, beginning in 1607 was the first. In contrast with the later Plymouth colony in what became Massachusetts, it was not established with visions of religious freedom. 
but rather with visions of making a profit, preferably from day one, if at all possible. And the reason they thought they could was because of the global climate model in use in the early 17th century. Now, the English didn't have a lot of long-term experience with the North American environment. Explorers had had a few weeks or months experience in a few places, and the Roanoke colony, which had been sent over in the 1580s, hadn't survived. And their understanding of climate was that climate is consistent by latitude, which meant that all points south of London, which includes basically all of North America, including Newfoundland, were expected to be warmer than England. And so they were expected to be able to produce products that come from warm climates. Jamestown is on the same latitude as Spain. So it was expected to produce things like wine and silk. Over the next several decades, Jamestown gave this a go. They tried wine, they tried silk, these failed. They tried glass blowing, that was not a success. They did find tobacco, that was a success. And on that basis, history and archeology span show us that they were able to establish plantations further inland. And then in 1619, the first representative government in what would become the American colonies was established at Jamestown, such that Jamestown is recognized as being the first permanent English settlement in North America, and it served as the capital of Virginia until 1699. But what didn't happen was a reckoning with their understanding of climate. By the 1640s, it was clear from the experience side of things that Virginia, indeed, much of the rest of the East Coast were both colder and warmer than expected, and it was colder and warmer than England. But they didn't know why. And the conclusion that they came to was not that their model was wrong, but rather, in the words of historian Karen Cooperman, the colonists firmly believed that the climate of America, under the impact of settlement by Europeans with their agricultural technology, would become healthier, warmer, and more temperate. So in this view, what was needed was not a change in thinking at all, but rather more civilization. England was their model for how a climate should work, and it had been cultivated for centuries. And so sort of disregarding the Native American agriculture that surrounded them, surely the North American climate would become what they wanted it to be if they just kept doing what they were doing. Therefore, I suggest that one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves as we try to figure out what to do about the modern phenomenon of climate change is, have we changed? In the four centuries since Jamestown was founded, have the relationships between our investors, our economy, our representative government, and what we want our climate to be been updated? I'm gonna hold that question there for a moment. And then there are three threads that I'm gonna pull out from this story. So my first thread is that one, in one respect, at least, the colonists were right. Under the impact of development and industrial practices that began in Europe, it has gotten warmer. This is a graph of temperature variations going back over the last millennium. There were cooler temperatures up to about a century ago the warmest temperatures on record are happening now. And this includes a recording of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is close to, if not the hottest temperature recorded in Death Valley in the US in July of this summer. And the projection that there will be some places on the planet that will exceed the Paris Agreement's preferred limit of warming of 1.5 degrees C over pre-industrial levels by 2025. And very briefly to confirm, so I don't expect I have to, but so that it's there, the evidence is unequivocal that this warming is due to increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, rising from changes in land use, such as our development and the burning of fossil fuels. These warming trends are having a wide range of physical consequences, many of which I'm sure you are all familiar with. So I'll just put an illustration there of melting Arctic and glacial ice, melting permafrost, changes in precipitation, storms and fires, and rising sea levels. Now, some of these consequences are putting the very place that the Jamestown colonists landed and the remains of their experiences at risk of erosion, inundation, and saturation. For example, Jamestown Island currently looks like this. Minimum projections of sea level rise by 2050 look like this. 
and a storm surge from a category two hurricane at current sea level, such as Hurricane Florence that hit the Eastern seaboard in 2018, at mean tide looks like this. Now Jamestown Island is part of Colonial National Historical Park, which is part of the US National Park System. And as Victoria introduced me, for seven years, I held the role of Climate Change Adaptation Coordinator for Cultural Resources with the National Park Service. And what this long clunky title means is I was in the lead role for figuring out what climate change would mean for cultural resources, cultural heritage, which includes archeological sites, historic buildings and structures, cultural landscapes, everything that supports and holds indigenous and traditional lifeways, which we called ethnographic resources and museum collections and archives across the country. And then what the MPS and its federal, state, tribal and local communities should do in response. One of my starting points for this work was recognizing that cultural heritage has always been affected by environmental forces. Climate change is not moving us from a situation of no environmental stress to environmental stress. Rather, what climate change is doing is it's accelerating, intensifying, and recombining environmental stresses, and in some places, adding new ones. For example, for a long time, it's been known that Jamestown Island has been subject to erosion. For quite a while, it was thought that the original James Fort had been lost to the James River through erosion. And in the bottom photo uh, here on the left, there's actually been a seawall in place to protect that portion of the island for more than 100 years. So seawalls are actually part of the historic environment there. And it's been possible to model storm surges over the island, such as the maps that I was just showing you. But what has also come together in the last few years is evidence that the water table under the island is also rising. And this is saturating archeological sites in the island from the bottom up. And given what we currently know for at least some of the sites, it's possible they will be saturated from the bottom up before they're eroded from the side or inundated from the top. So sometimes the impacts that are most destructive or immediate are the ones we can't see directly. Now, as part of my program in preparation for the writing the MPS Cultural Resources Climate Change Strategy, I asked an intern who was working with me to gather all the information she could find on the impacts of climate change on cultural heritage. And over two years, drawing from published sources and interviews with resource managers in the field, she compiled this five page table that I've just grabbed here of observed and anticipated impacts. And on this basis, we made the assessment that climate change is affecting or will affect cultural heritage in every park in the national park system. Now, going back to that idea that we've always had environmental stress, this adds more consequences to that situation. What ongoing environmental stress means is we've never had a quote, full set of cultural heritage. There's never been a guarantee that what has survived to a given generation will continue on to the next. What climate change is now doing is it is creating a situation in which legal protections that establish parks and other protected areas really will not stop climate change. And so it is up to us to decide what heritage, whether it is inside park boundaries or whether it is outside, is most important to have with us into the future and to take steps to actively preserve it. Now, for the last 50 years in the US, under the National Historic Preservation Act, there have been four criteria that have guided, by and large, how the US has selected what heritage is most important to save. Listed here are the eligibility criteria of the National Register of Historic Places. I'm going to call out the first three to start. And these address association with important events, association with important people, and heritage and cultural resources that embody a distinctive characteristics of a type or period or our work of a master. Now, by and large, heritage that fits these three descriptions tend to be very place-based. They include places like battlefields, this is Gettysburg, places important to important people, I've grabbed the Cesar Chavez National Monument, or amazing architecture, this is Falling Waters, um, designed by architect Frank Lloyd Wright. But I want, and I think the Black Lives Matters protests of this summer were powerful reminders, if we needed them, of just how potent such places can be in shaping landscape and memory. But with that in mind, I want to ask, what if, 
what if what is most important to us and generations into the future as we face climate change is a process? This is the second thread I'm gonna pull from the Jamestown story. Now the Jamestown colonists needed to learn how to live in their new environment. They had to draw this map, just as anyone arriving in an unfamiliar place needs to figure out how to live there. Now we may all be familiar with this at an individual level. When you move to a new place, or you travel to a new city for a meeting or a conference. Yes, we mostly have smartphones now that can help with navigation. But the point is, if, you, if any of us didn't have this source of information that had been gathered by other people, we would have to figure out all of that navigation ourselves using local clues. Learning is also required at the community and society-wide scale. And this may be the easiest to visualize when we think about initial migrations or colonizations, essentially when a group of people collectively moves into a place that they don't know and they have to learn how to live here. And my illustration for this is a possible map of the initial peopling of the Americas as it's currently conceived um, that at some point, pe pe the people who arrived were the first ones to live there. And so they had to figure out the whole continent and how to live there themselves. Now, looking at how humans learn new or unfamiliar environments, particularly in relation to migration and colonization, was the focus of work I did as an archaeologist before I became deeply involved in climate change policy. So what I'm going to tell you about over the next few minutes is based on that work. Now, I started this work at the mid 19 in looking at the mid 19th century gold rush in Wyoming at the site of South Pass City. Now, if you didn't know that Wyoming had a gold rush, this is not unusual. My reason for doing this work is that I wanted to save the planet through recycling. And to do that, I realized that I needed and wanted to know the origins of modern, at the time, 20th century values for natural resources. There's a longer story here than I have time to tell you about today. So I will just say, it's not possible to find the origins of something by only studying the present. For that, you have to go into the past. So my first challenge was to see if I could identify natural resources values in the record. I needed to build that method. So I started with this hunting and fauna during the Wyoming gold rush. I wanted to see how miners focused on getting rich from gold, interacted with other natural resources around them, such as wild game and the practice of hunting. What I found was that miners actually had little need and apparently fairly little knowledge of how to hunt, so they didn't do it very much. What was even more interesting, though, is that it also turned out they didn't know much about the gold deposits of the area. Rather, they appear to have brought with them expectations about how gold deposits would be found from earlier gold rushes elsewhere in the American West, such as Colorado and California. And the process of figuring out the specific and complex geology of Western Wyoming took longer than the gold rush economy could support, and the gold rush of Wyoming collapsed fairly quickly, which is why we don't know a whole lot about it. From this, I asked, what if it's not only gold rush miners who had to learn their environments. What if we could look at learning across a whole range of migrations and colonizations? What might we learn about the learning process? And with my original question of the history of natural resource values in mind, what might it help us understand about ourselves living in the world today? So I put together a model, simple model of the learning process that I called landscape learning. And it has three primary pieces. First is locational knowledge. This is information about the spatial and physical characteristics of particular resources, like finding stone for tools, good water sources, or for mining. And I propose that likely locational knowledge can be found pretty quickly once it's sought, provided that resource exists in the environment. Next is limitational knowledge. And yes, I made up that word, but here's a definition of it. This is information about the usefulness and reliability of various resources and their cycles of variation within the overall environment. How cold does it get in the winter? Where does it flood? When does it storm? How many animals can be hunted and still have them return next year? Now, this kind of knowledge is distinctly different from locational knowledge in that it can only be gathered over time. You have to go through at least one cycle to know what that cycle looks like and potentially more. 
The third type is social knowledge. And this is the collection and storage of locational and limitational knowledge in a form that's remembered and transmitted by a group to succeeding generations. Now the time frame for developing social knowledge is uncertain because of course it depends on the nature and time frames for the locational and limitational knowledge that go into it and how it's remembered. How long social knowledge can be maintained is another really fascinating question. Within the past few years, information has been circulated that some of the indigenous Australians near Melbourne have maintained memories of islands off the coast of Melbourne that have, were submerged at the end of the last ice age when the sea levels rose. So that's more than 10,000 years. More tragically, some adaptations to earthquakes were developed in Haiti in the later 18th century, but due to various social developments and likely impacts of hurricanes, this knowledge was not in active use when the 2010 earthquake did so much damage in Port-au-Prince. Now, with this model, I started to build and test predictions for how we might see these learning stages in the archaeological record, in the archaeological record, excuse me. Perhaps the briefest way to sum up what happened in Wyoming is that the gold miners effectively stalled out at the locational knowledge stage. I want to go a little bit deeper into the social knowledge piece. And there's an example from Northern Alaska that I want to share with you with, that is the best one I've read of well-developed social knowledge. Now, the information I will share with you is from ethnographic and archaeological work published in the 1980s by Leah Mink and Kevin Smith. Any errors in representing their work is my fault, and I expect there may be people on this call who know a lot more about this history and area than I do. So I will explain why I think this is a really powerful example, and if there's information about this area that I am missing, I would very much love to learn it. The example includes the Terra Umut and the Nunamut peoples. The Terra Umut are coastal peoples uh, with a focus on hunting, particularly whales and other sea mammals. And the Nunamut live more inland with a focus on caribou. An analysis of approximately a thousand years worth of environmental records indicates that there have been long cycles in the range of a hundred years or more, alternating favorable and unfavorable coastal and inland conditions. Archaeological data from this area of Alaska shows periodic relocations of settlement concentrations between the coast and inland areas that appear to line up with those variations between sea ice cover and inland drought. And then what Mink and Smith documented in the 1980s, alongside with this ecological and archaeological information, are several levels of oral tradition that emphasize the importance of maintaining social connections between the interior, the coastal and interior zones. These included maintaining norms of feasting and trading, despite some underlying antagonism, and then hunting traditions that emphasize the dual relationships of coastal prey and inland game, including instances in which one form of prey is described as transforming into the other, whales into caribou and caribou into whales. And one of the ways that Mink and Smith describe the connections between ecological, archeological, and oral traditions is that knowing what to do and where to go when things get bad in one place is not just a social possibility, but because of the oral traditions, it's part of the sacred order of the world. One of the things I find so profound about this example is its length. It describes adaptation to conditions that varied on a scale longer than a single human lifetime. Given the evidence I currently have to hand, I can't tell you how these societies created and maintained this knowledge. What is useful for us in the moment is the evidence that they did. When disasters happen in modern US society, I have lost track of the number of times I have heard the, the explanation, well, you know, humans just have short memories. It's just so hard to remember. What the Terra Umut and Nunamut show us is that while individuals do have memories that cover the span of their lifetimes, societies can have much longer ones. Cultural practice, social structures, language, the landscape itself, and the sites, artifacts, and monuments in it, these remember for us. If modern society is not doing a sufficient job of remembering from one disaster to the next, what the study of landscape learning shows us is it's not the fault of human biology, it's because our human society has not created the social knowledge to do it. Since I did that first work in Wyoming, landscape learning has been used to examine migrations ranging from the earliest movement of hominids out of Africa, 
exploration and settlement across the Pacific, the movement of agriculture across Europe in the Neolithic, the arrival of people in the Americas, and the movement of people to Jamestown, among others. I see the process of landscape learning as being one of the great links between heritage around the world, places that are separated by a hemisphere and a millennia, holding common records of how people have learned, forgotten, relearned, not learned, and figured out the consequences of it in the places that they live. Returning to climate change, we are now in the process of changing our environment around us. For some, this has already meant relocation to safer places that are relatively in the region. And I'm just going to point to New Talk in Alaska and the Ile de Jean Charles community in Louisiana. For some of our other fellow global citizens, such as those who have left Syria for Europe and Africa for Europe and countries in Central America for Mexico and the US, they will need whole new constellations of locational, limitational, and social knowledge. And even for those who don't move physically, the environments that currently characterize major urban areas here shown in the US are projected to shift hundreds of miles over the next 60 years. So altogether, climate change has created a project for all of society. Collectively, we need not only to understand what is changing, intensifying, and accelerating, we need to learn how to live in whole new environments. Therefore, understanding the learning process, including how modern society has and does intersect with learning, could not be more important. Being able to identify, protect, and learn from heritage that helps us learn about learning also could not be more important. Third thread. What Jamestown and our example from Northern Alaska show us is that the stories we tell ourselves and each other about how our environment works and what our relations to it should be have strong real world consequences. And one of the stories that has been told to us for the past 30 years is that cultural heritage in the human past do not have roles to play in modern climate response. This is the table of contents from the fourth US National Climate Assessment, which was released in 2018. It includes a section on tribal and indigenous peoples and many of the regional sections also to various extents also address climate stresses on indigenous and tribal peoples. In these sections, again, to various extents, it's recognized that tribal and indigenous peoples have history and heritage and that climate change will affect, affect these. And this is absolutely true. And these sections must be in this report and all reports on climate change. But the inverse of this attention is important too. That by omission in how this report is set up, non-Indigenous communities and society and culture in the US has no history and it has no heritage. And non-history and non-heritage have nothing to do with climate change. And what I wanted to show you with the story of Jamestown is, this is not true. Over the past several months, referring again to our Black Lives Matters movement, it has so powerfully made the point that racism and the inequality that come with it are systemic and that we cannot unwind these, we cannot address them without recognizing the deep history of that racism. Going back to the arrival of the first slaves in mainland North America in 1619 that because of that history, racism and inequality has been built into our landscapes, into our language, into our economic systems and into our monuments. What I wanted to show you with the history of Jamestown is, this is also true for climate. If we need to pick a year, 1619, which is the year of the first meeting of representative government that would become the structure of the government for the American colonies, that year is also meaningful. And from that point, expectations and desires for how the environment should work has been built into our landscapes, into our language, into our political, intellectual, and economic systems, and into our monuments. If we're gonna address climate change well, we also need to address how deep the relationships and expectations that created it are. And I called out the National Climate Assessment. The gaps that I mentioned are not only there, and I'm just going to point to one other. I'm going to mention the Global Commission on Adaptation, which, was rele which released its major report in September 2019 at the Global Climate Action Summit. And it looks at the status and major directions of climate adaptation 
around the world. Its development was led by Ban Ki-moon and Bill Gates, among others. This report holds two uses of the word culture, both within a total of four sentences on indigenous peoples, and one use of the word heritage in a statement that world heritage sites are among the coastal assets that will be affected by flooding, and so that will impact tourism. That's it. So to bring these few pieces of heads together for the moment, in terms of climate science and policy, one of the things that is so important with respect to culture and heritage is to see not only what is there, but to recognize and call out what isn't. And what I'm gonna do in the final section of my talk is share with you two tools that may help with this. So earlier, I briefly mentioned four criteria for eligibility from the National Register, and I described three of them. The fourth criterion, criterion D, is the one I'm gonna talk about now. And it recognizes the importance of places that, quote, have yielded or may be likely to yield information important in history or prehistory. While I was at the National Park Service, I had the chance to ask the historian of the National Register about this criterion and whether there had been any vision when it was written of what kind of information would be considered significant. And he said, actually, no, that particular criterion was written really quickly without a whole lot of discussion. So there isn't an underlying deep vision for it. But then he noted that the practice that has developed around it in the decades since has been to put it to contemporary society to decide what it most needs to learn from the past, which opens up quite an array of opportunity. So with this in mind, I'm gonna share with you the National Park Service's Director's Policy Memorandum 1402, Climate Change and Stewardship of Cultural Resources, which was put out in 2014. And it includes this paragraph which talks about valuing information from the past. Very quickly, National Register cha criteria challenge us to identify and manage not only our known and honored heritage, but also to understand how cultural resources can address questions about the past. Such questions must now include how our modern climate situation has come about and how human societies have responded to climatic and environmental variability in the past. Incorporating these questions into our significance evaluations is another critical piece. To the best of my knowledge, this policy memo is the highest level document in the US government regarding management of cultural heritage in relation to climate change. And again, to the best of my knowledge, it remains in effect. Together, National Register criteria and this policy document give us a basis in established policy that we need the heritage that helps us learn how we have learned unfamiliar environments. I don't know yet if these two pieces have been used together. I don't know how powerful they can be and we won't know until we try to use them. But I wanted you to know that these pieces exist as you go forward in your work in case they become useful. Second and finally, there's an effort underway to raise the demand for this kind of knowledge and heritage and the heritage that supports it that is just now getting underway. Is a project we go, uh, is a project to assess and provide a basis to improve integration of knowledge from and about culture and heritage in reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This project is under the leadership of ECOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, UNESCO, which I believe you all know, and the IPCC. The goals of this project are to host an IPCC co-sponsored expert meeting on culture, heritage, and climate change, and through the work of that meeting, assess our state of knowledge on the connections between culture, heritage, and climate. And then three, to really more broadly use the preparation, the meeting, and the follow-up as a catalyst for new partnerships and work, including potentially, just potentially, an IPCC special report on culture, heritage, and climate change. Now, I need to quickly say, this project is not taking place because the IPCC has not engaged with culture and heritage. It has. And particularly in its three most recent special reports, the IPCC has addressed intersections between climate change and lifeways and knowledge systems of indigenous peoples. Particularly in the special report on oceans and cryosphere, which was released last year, they point to issues and concerns around what is defined as two-eyed seeing, that bringing together of indigenous ways of knowing and Western or other forms of scientific knowledge. 
while preserving the distinctiveness of each. The IPCC has recognized that there's much more work needed in this area, and there is still a tendency to prioritize Western approaches. What's also become clear from these reports is that there's a lot about culture and heritage that is just not known. Putting here a very blurry grab of that table again of impacts, we have a sense that these impacts will occur, but even knowing that they occur, we don't know when, we don't know how severe they will be, and we don't know what the consequences will be of losing that heritage. So there is assessment that is needed. And I have to say there is also concern in setting up this project, not only from the IPCC assessment side, but also from the perspective of how heritage knowledge is produced and the challenge in connecting is what is known to issues raised by climate change. And I'm showing you an example here from the IPCC's fifth assessment report that has concerned me greatly for years. Box 1604, Historical Perspectives on Limits to Adaptation. It provides a number of very brief case examples of past societies interacting with past environmental change, such as medieval Greenland, ancient Egypt, and the classic Maya. Key thing is, it ends with this statement. It would be useful to consider how lessons learned from historical experience may relate to the perceived multiple environmental changes characterized by the Anthropocene era. Now the IPCC is not a synthesis organization. They assess what is known, but they don't then go and make broader summaries and, and build on that. They just bring together what has been published. So the summary statement, it would be useful to consider is very likely an accurate representation of the conclusions of past and current archeological work. And if it is, then there is a whole lot of work that needs to happen on the archeological side too, to figure out how to get beyond. It would be useful and may relate to realizing that useful and actually making those connections. Because if we don't do that, what will happen is with all the challenges our world is facing from climate change, we'll continue to leave centuries and millennia of human experience effectively off the table. So while I can raise specific examples and the anecdotes that I know, what's needed is a strong wide ranging assessment of where things stand in terms of using and recognizing culture and heritage in the global climate response. And this will be a basis from which to grow the contributions of culture and heritage. This project was initiated by ECOMOS in 2019. This is me talking at our launch at the 43rd meeting of the World Heritage Committee. UNESCO became a partner in late 2019. And we have also now have partnerships with IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, ICLE, Local Governments and Sustainability. And one of my ECOMOS colleagues, Andrew Potts and I will be talking, I believe tomorrow morning with the facilitative working group of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change's Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. And we will be asking for their vote to become a partner in the project as well. And we are very much hoping that it will be possible for them to do that. In mid-March of this year, UNESCO and ECOMOS made a proposal to the IPCC saying, would you please co-sponsor this expert meeting? And we are very lucky that in mid-June they said yes. And what this means is we are now standing up our committees. We are getting all the pieces together. Uh, we are figuring out how to hold this online. It will be uh, probably 50 to 75 experts drawn from around the world from heritage and climate change and likely will be held in mid-2021. In the proposal that we made to the IPCC, we outlined five overarching scientific questions that we will use as the basis or the organizing framework for assessing the state of knowledge. They're actually huge. They're more like big buckets of questions. And what I'm gonna do is try to quickly summarize them and let you know that issues of migration and relocation are woven throughout them. First overarching question are the systemic connections of culture and heritage, of culture, heritage and climate change. This includes recognizing that culture and heritage are manifest in many forms across many scales. So how does that intersect with our approaches to climate change? That combination of indigenous people's ways of knowing and Western approaches to science and recognizing that climate change itself has a history as do all communities. The second question includes cultural governance. Who decides what heritage is? How is heritage knowledge manage, managed? Uh, what are the relationships of this to equity particularly in situations of migration and relocation. There are intersections of heritage with conflict and security, including misuse and stress, and the building of collaboration and knowledge networks. 
Question three looks at loss, damage, and adaptation for culture and heritage. And this is the broad space of everything having to do with physical and intangible impacts, vulnerability, significance, prioritization, adaptive management, and how we deal with loss. And we particularly call out issues of impacts, transitions, and loss in relation to migration and relocation. Fourth question is our capacity to learn from the past, including using information in the past in climate models and policy, maintenance and reintroduction of indigenous peoples and traditional approaches, and finding common ground between climate and heritage questions. The way this question is phrased in our proposal, it does not specifically say past migrations, but if you read the text there, which will be available, and I can tell you because I'm one of the people who drafted it, migration, past migrations and relocations are absolutely relevant to that question as well. And then finally, question five, our roles of culture and heritage in transformative change and alternative sustainable futures. And this is enormous, just boiled down to two points here, the capacity of historic buildings and landscapes and traditional land use to hold carbon and culture and heritage as inspiration for art, connection, understanding and action on climate. The outcome of this meeting will be most directly a report with recommendations to the IPCC. I can't tell you exactly what those recommendations will be, but I expect they will address ways for the IPCC to incorporate more culture and heritage in its seventh assessment report and future special reports. Beyond that, my colleagues and I are looking at the development and the hosting of this meeting as a catalyst, a way for starting to foster new research at the intersections of culture, heritage, and climate change, for finding new ways to use that information and inspiration from culture and heritage for climate change and building new collaborations to move all of this forward in coming years. So I really hope that my presentation today is just the start of a conversation that will also continue for some time to come. I'm gonna end with one more story from Jamestown. Now back in 2002, I asked archeologist Dennis Blanton to look at the early history of Jamestown from the perspective of landscape learning. Now Dennis led the archeological work at Jamestown from the late 1990s onward up to the 400th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown. So he knows this place and its history very deeply. And what he did is he put together a three phase approach, 1607 to 1618, 1618 to 1680, uh, initial expansion period, and then 1680 to 1750, the emergent Chesapeake Society period. I was just starting to work on my model at that time. So he didn't use the terms locational, limitational, or social knowledge, or test my predictions. But there are some fascinating parallels and implications with what he came up with. For example, the creation of the representative government at Jamestown in 1619 falls just at the close of, a first, of the first phase that he defined that has the characterization faulty environmental knowledge, which I find fascinating. What he also described is the process of creation of a new cultural form, which he calls the Chesapeake Society period, what we have come to know as tidewater culture, and what really the history of that part of the Americas has had a tremendous role in the trajectory of the US ever since. Creating such a culture was not the original objective of sending colonists to Jamestown. Back when I was first moving from my work in recycling to beginning to look at gold rush miners, I worked on a project at the University of Arizona called the Garbage Project. This project used archeological techniques to study modern garbage and see what the results would say about the modern world. And this is our leader, Bill Rathje at Fresh Kills Landfill in New York. One of our projects surveyed households about what they ate and then analyzed their garbage. You would think the results would be boring. Oh no. Even when people know you will be looking at their garbage, they will still tell you that they drank less soda and less beer and ate more cottage cheese than they actually did. This is the power of the archeological technique to show that humans are capable of saying they want to do one thing, but actually do another. In the 1640s, at least, what the colonists wrote, at least for their investors, that led to this summary statement was that it was still possible for settlements in Virginia to make it all like England. But the archeological record analyzed by Dennis Blanton shows by that point, they were already doing something different. They were already building something new. 
And this interplay between what a community and what a society wants and believes and what it does is the essence of culture in interaction with an environment. What goes into that interaction, what shapes it, and how it is used to inform the interactions that come next, that is what determines how able we are to live in any place that we find ourselves. What Jamestown shows us is there's still so much we have to learn, even from migrations that we think we know well. And from other migrations that we don't know as well, there's potential to learn many other things that we need to know about ourselves as the world changes around us. So with that, I will say thank you so much for all the work you are doing. I am really excited. I so appreciate you listening to me for this long space and I will do my best to answer any questions you might have. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. If everyone could, uh, give Marcy a virtual round of applause <laughs> for an incredibly insightful and story-filled presentation. As a reminder, we have just about a half hour for questions and answers, comments, discussion with Marcy. If you have a question, please go to the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand so that I can unmute you. Um, or you can put your question in the chat um, and I can either read it aloud if you don't have a good connection um, or you can come on and ask it in question uh, on a video or a recording. Maybe to start us off, um, I'll ask a quick question. If you, Marcy, can talk about um, the importance of a multidisciplinary convening around cultural heritage. So we have a wide variety of disciplines in our 500 person network, some of which are archaeologists and cultural heritage practitioners, some are indigenous and traditional knowledge holders, but some are biologists and some are macroecologists. There are public health workers. Um, there are people who are experts in their own hometowns. And I wonder if you can talk a bit about your experience and maybe the importance of why everyone should care about cultural heritage in relation to climate change reporting and policy. Um, and, and what's the role of those multidisciplinary conversations of inviting more people to this table? I think, to answer this quickly, I mean, the more disciplines you can get at the table, I think the better that is. And I think actually, let me run back to one of my slides just so I can point at it and wave my hands. Nope, not that one. Um, anyway, I really wanted to point to, oh, it's this one. But I'm just gonna actually, I'm just gonna delete that photo. Um, so we can see it. There is no way that anyone discipline would have figured out how incredible the knowledge encapsulated in this particular place is and how it might have developed. They needed the people who understood the physical natural world and how it was fluctuating. We needed the social context to understand the people who are there today the folks who are able to understand the stories and the depth and the complexity of their knowledge. And then the archaeology that starts to say, wait, this is not only now, but this is developed over time. And that it's that combination of the world and how we know it and how we have known it and how those have all worked together. That's what gives us a real story and an understanding of what it means to live in any place or to move to a new place. So um, I think it's understanding that, that combined the combination gives us is absolutely vital for bringing together knowledge that creates a whole that is actually useful. And I think the key is having that framework to bring those pieces together. For me, obviously, landscape learning and understanding our landscape gives me a, a frame to pull all of these pieces together. I'm sure there are others. I can't think what they are right now. But um, I had one uh, 
colleague here in DC who used to work for the Bureau of Land Management. And he had this wonderful phrase, he called it integration by stapler, which just means you have everyone, you know, write their separate reports and then you just staple them all together. Voila, it's a combined report. And we're like, yeah, integration by stapler gets us nowhere. But it's the combining of stories of being able to understand how the different pieces interact and inform on each other, or sometimes, like with that Jamestown, like, wait, they were saying one thing, but doing another. That's also really interesting. And so it's, you can only find those by looking across multiple disciplines. Yeah, I, I really like that integration by stapler as <laughs> yeah. what not to do. Um, and that, you know, true integration is absolutely helped along by a framework like landscape learning, right? Providing everyone with a common ground upon which to start learning, building, and collaborating. And um, I think that, you know, I too am a little biased uh, because of your passion and expertise on landscape learning, but it's a, you know, a great framework to, to invite more voices to the table. Um, I'm going to see if April Taylor wants to come on um, either audio or video to share a comment and a, a resource. Yeah, this is April Taylor. I'm a, a tribal liaison with the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Yeah. Um, and so I was just sharing um, that we're working on the first um, report called Status of Tribes and Climate Change. And we have included mm -hmm. uh, a cultural resources chapter and that's supposed to be um, coming out uh, as a published in February of 2021. And so we'll be doing some outreach and things for it, but just something. Um, and so the idea is again, the sort of concept that she, Marcy was talking about is how do we get these things into these key reports and yep. so the reason behind this, this report that we're doing is for uh, preparation for a potential NCA5 coming up. <laughs> if it, I know it's been delayed, but, um, right. so, but I was just sharing that. Thank you so much, April. That is great to know that that is coming out. I hope it makes it into the NCA5. That sounds like quite quite a shuffle at the moment. Maybe that's the, the word I will use uh, for the moment. Um, but we are, and I'll say we're still figuring out how we are going to pull together all of the resources that we want to use for this culture and heritage IPCC assessment. And we have started to have a number of those conversations about just how do you find the literature that is most relevant and then the IPCC is known as being very rigorous. So how do we match their rigor, but with finding some areas of knowledge that may not be represented in fully in the peer reviewed literature, but are really, really vital for covering some culture and heritage pieces. So we're starting to negotiate those pieces. So um, I'm really glad to know that your report is coming out. So we will, we will try to tack it. I will try to keep an eye out for it as well. And going off of that, we have one follow-up question for you, Marcy, about NCA5. So that is the next installment of the National Climate Assessment for the United States and U.S. territories. Um, and this participant wants to know what you would like to see in NCA5 with cultural heritage inclusion. That's a great question. Um, so I'll say back in the NCA4, um, they actually originally put out the outline for peer review. And I submitted some comments and I suggested that they should actually have a chapter on cultural heritage. And then they released, I mean, they put so much work into the NCA4. I can't, I can't be too gripey about it, but they did decide to release the final table of contents the day that comments were due, which sort of meant that they didn't incorporate the comments that they got. Yeah, um, and basically they responded to me saying, we don't know how to do this. And so they, they didn't figure it out. Um, so there are two sort of approaches. One would be to actually have a, a chapter, a titled chapter on cultural heritage. And another is to just simply ensure, simply, um, it's probably not that simple, but to ensure that people who are knowledgeable about culture and heritage are integrated parts of all of the writing teams. 
because it is only by getting those concepts into the table of contents and into the initial scoping of the report that you can really make a difference into how it's shaped. And sort of the way the NCA4 came together is they didn't put it into the table of contents. There were not many cultural heritage people in the writing teams. There are a group of us that reviewed it and supplied comments and revisions afterward. But once the text is already sort of shaped and everyone's under a deadline, it's really hard to really substantively change it. And the most important things is to ensure that there are people who can say, wait a minute, we need this topic in this piece. We need to organize it like this so that we can actually represent this knowledge. So I think where they're stalled out at the moment is that they haven't been reaching out to invite the authors for the NCA5. So maybe in a way, this is an opportunity to try to open up that process a little bit more, but that's what I would most like to see is either a titled chat section, which hopefully would be written by someone qualified, but then really getting more culture and heritage people onto the, all of the writing teams. Thank you for that question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, you know, a, a bigger question and model of how to effectively integrate uh, cultural heritage into climate science and climate policy. And um, just thinking about the IPCC uh, special reports and an expert meeting versus mm -hmm. the fifth US National Climate Assessment, um, that one is targeted at just bringing together cultural heritage experts, knowledge holders, um, separately in order to better uplift that versus integrating them within every single chapter, regional and topical. So thinking about, you know, when is it useful for cultural heritage to have its own space in climate research and policy? And where is it essential to integrate into every corner of climate policy, climate research, climate assessments? Um, so we have another comment um, from Jennifer, and I can read it for us just so we have it on the recording. And maybe Marcy, if you want to comment on that, um, on Jennifer's comment. Okay. So Jennifer uh, is talking about the book Breeding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall uh Kimmerer which I highly suggest if you have not read to read and she starts her book with origin stories colonists coming to uh the current United States with an origin story of Adam and Eve a contract of being thrown out of the wilderness to change the environment around them and not to trust it versus a native origin stories of how to live with and in the environment. Um, and I wonder if you want to talk about maybe the, the wider importance of the stories that we build our landscape relationships upon and our relationship with the environment, um, our perceptions of nature being within versus beyond us as humans uh, and maybe how those inform you know decision making today around how we learn from landscapes uh, how we work to uh, you know conserve to adapt to build resilience in climate policy uh, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that book um, I will say it's on I'm on in the queue for it from the public library. I've been waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks. I had I think intended to read it once. And then I heard an interview with Robin Wall Kimmerer on Krista Tippett's On Being podcast. I was like, ah, oh, I need to read this. And I've, I've been on the waiting list ever since. I think I'm getting close. Um, and that concept of the origin story is so profound. Um, and I think I hadn't had the Adam and Eve story in my head, um, which is an incredibly, obviously important one. There is another book that was formative in my thinking uh, called Wilderness in the American Mind that came out, I think it was published in the late 1970s by Roderick Nash. And he looked at the history of the concept of wilderness and sort of how wilderness had been viewed, particularly from medieval Europe onward and the sense that wilderness was considered 
it was that thing that needed to be beaten back, which may be a, an extension of the Adam and Eve story, but it was something that was bad. It needed to be conquered. And there's some timing, sort of the, the Spanish finished extending their, their grasp across uh, Grenada in like 1492. And then at that point they send Columbus to the new world and it just sort of keeps, keeps on going. And a lot of the early writings of the colonists who arrived in North America and, the, and their sense of what was forbidding and foreboding and that, that need to push back. And I think, I mean, the threads of what needs to be pushed back and conquered is so deep that it's sometimes it's hard. We don't even realize what's there. And I'm sure, I know there's been so much writing about the transitions that happened with the preservation movements that started to come in in the 19th century with John Muir and Sierra Club and all that with people starting to realize, wait, we, we shouldn't be pushing all of this back. But then again, you have this intersection of what do we define as wilderness now is a place that's supposed to be pristine, which means we erase the whole human history that have been in those places. And so that's another tussle there where we now recognize, well, we need wilderness. We need places that are untouched. But they're actually at this point, there is no place on the planet that's untouched. And so we're telling ourselves another story by calling wilderness uh, un untouched. And there was, um, if you know the writer Bill Cronin, he's an environmental historian and he writes absolutely beautifully. And he wrote a, a wonderful piece on the history of wilderness. It's called The Trouble with Wilderness. And I'm not gonna do it, his phrasing justice, but he said, essentially, if we frame wilderness to be that place where humans are not, then it can provide no solutions for the places in which we live. But if we at the same time say, well, that's where our true selves are. And if by sort of being there and experiencing wilderness, that, that is how we become truly human, then we're not taking responsibility for the places in which we live. And so we, we definitely, especially in the Western world, are struggling to find that fit between how do we live in this world, not conquering it, but being in it. Um, and we haven't figured that out, but um, I will definitely read uh, that book as soon as it comes up in my library queue. So thank you. Yeah, I um, am fortunate enough that I did get it from the library prior to the pandemic. Uh, and we have shared that in the chat for those of you who are interested um, in taking out that book from your local library uh, or purchasing it online. We have another question come in from Jim and he wants to know, how do you overcome the challenges of limited resources and logistics, especially during COVID, to effectively consult with Indigenous groups on climate change efforts at the federal level? How can we do this in a timely manner within the federal government process? And I would add that if you could also maybe talk a bit about how those challenges work at the international level, because I know your work today is primarily pushing for an expert meeting and to ensure cultural heritage and traditional and indigenous knowledge in IPCC reports. Mm -hmm. So could we maybe uh, get an answer for Jim on the US federal level, but also your thoughts on the international level too? Yeah, so I feel like I don't have really good advice at the US federal level, because in the roles that I was in, in the US government, that wasn't my main purview. And so I wasn't in the role, I could sort of write about engaging with tribes, but I wasn't the person who actually did it. And I just had this sense of like, we could probably be doing this a lot better. We could be doing it more. But at the same time, I know that some of my colleagues who are in the field and doing the engagement, there were a number who had built, a, as far as I understood, very strong working relationships. And I think that sense of having, perhaps that's the best piece of advice I have, is building those longer term working relationships and not parachuting in when there's a problem and trying to just solve that problem, but building a relationship so that there is a point of contact and they get to know the tribes and the tribal contacts and their schedules and their needs and back and forth and creating that conversation. And I, my sense was I had some colleagues in the park service who had built those relationships and those seemed to be the most successful. I can't say it happened everywhere, but there were some that had tried to do that. Um, so the more that relationship building can be built uh, is probably the way forward. 
at the international scale, I would definitely say I'm still in the learning phase. And we've been very lucky to become connected to the facilitative working group of the UNFCCC. And we're definitely learning from them what it means to engage with them. And they have a very broad representation, as I understand it's uh, seven different bioregions that are represented on that group. And so they are from all around the world. Um, and I think tomorrow we'll actually be discussing with them what it would mean to them to be part of the IPCC project. So I will know more in a few days. Um, and I think one of the best pieces of advice I got um, was actually before I was in the government, I was out in California working on cultural resources management and doing compliance under section 106 and California state laws. And so that is actually where I reached out to the tribes most often and I did try to create the working relationships. And what a couple tribal members said to me is like, please just give us as much time as you can to think over and look at something. And she said, it's not because we're necessarily slow, but almost no one there is working full-time on environmental compliance. They're all doing it. They're holding multiple roles and multiple jobs and they don't always have a full office. And they often need to take things to their elder councils, which don't meet all the time. They'll meet like once a month. So if you send something to them and they need to consult, they physically cannot do that very quickly because they need the council together to do that. So they said, please just give us as much time as you can. And they were just, I just remember how gracious they were and saying, we're not saying, we're not intending to shut down every project, but we want to be consulted. And that graciousness has, I've tried to carry that forward in into everything that I've done and, and pay that back as much as I can. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, I, I think so. Thank you. Um, we have one more question um, from a graduate student who wants to know how to get involved in this work. So I know we have a few graduate students on this call, but maybe generally for people who have not yet engaged at the nexus of climate policy, climate research, and cultural heritage, what, what is their next step after listening to your presentation today? Oh, that's a really good question. And, um, and I've, I've had a number of just amazing students come to me and say, I want to help. What can I do? And at the moment, I'm feeling a bit frozen because I don't have immediate capacity to sort of bring everyone together, though I would love, love, love to do that. And I think so my, my big, broad, overarching suggestion is, I mean, you've just seen for less than 45 minutes of me tell my story of sort of the history of my research question. And I started off wanting to save the planet through recycling, and then it ended up being an archaeological question. And then I could see that that archaeological question had relevance for policy. And so I've sort of followed that path. Is if you can find in, in what you do, in your field, whatever field it is, can you capture your question? What is that thing that you say, this is the gap that I see, or this is the problem that I see, and this is the one, not that you think other people want you to ask it, but it's the question around you keep finding new ways to ask it and new ways to test it, and that's the focus of your creativity, and you can see all the permutations of it and how you might do it, follow that, because we need that creativity. And we need that insight. And I can't tell you how many older, say established people in the field told me early on, you can't study landscape learning. People in the past, they just knew everything already anyway. So you'll never find it. And I said, well, I think actually the, that's a testable hypothesis. Could be, I could look for it and I won't find it, but then we know. But what happens if I could find it, then we could learn a whole lot more. And it turns out you can find it. You can, showed that you can, you can look for it. Um, but it took that just determination of saying, no, this is my question and I'm gonna go figure this piece out and I'm gonna keep trying to figure this piece out. And if you had told me 25 years ago that I would be sort of where I am now, I would be like, what, are you kidding me? Um, but I think it's, being, it's been able to keep explaining that question. And cause when it's your question, you can relate it to anything. And one of the things that got me into the policy world in DC wasn't climate change. I wanted to come to DC to do climate change, but at the time that I applied, there was no one looking for someone to do cultural heritage and climate change. So I ended up in an office at the EPA 
and it's the office that does decontamination following bioterrorism. And they wanted someone to work on risk communication. And I remember having this very fundamental question with the person who was running the office where he was explaining to me why they needed a social scientist to talk about risk communication. And I finally said, you do know I study dead people, right? And he finally said, we'd like to talk to them before they're dead. And, but then because I had that question in my head about landscape learning, something clicked. And I said, well, if we take people who've been through a disaster, through a bioterrorism event as now being in a changed environment, and the role of risk communication is help them figure out how to be there, then maybe I can help. And he was broad thinking enough to offer me the position. And so I spent two years figuring out how to talk about risk communication from the perspective of what people know about their environment and how to include that in risk communication. And if I hadn't been, had landscape learning so deeply in my soul, I probably couldn't have made that connection. But when it's your question, you can connect it with anything. So I think that would be, be my ultimate advice is to find that question and that piece of creativity and don't be scared of doing it if no one else is doing it because that means that is your piece. So I hope that helps maybe a little bit inspirational. It's terrifying, it is actually terrifying, but it's really, really useful. And yeah, we need, we need your creativity. Well, I think that is a pretty inspiring note to end on unless I see any other last minute hands or questions, which I highly encourage you to put your hand up, but being creative, being passionate, sticking to your research question, your approach, the thing that gets you up every morning and makes you yearn to answer it, even when there isn't an immediate opportunity, I think uh, is an inspiration I am going to take uh, back to my own work, but hopefully all of you will too. Um, so please, for the final time, join me in an incredible round of applause for Marcy Rockman, um, who uh, shared not just a wonderful presentation, but some incredible insights in this question and answer session. Um, as a reminder, we'll be sharing this recording on YouTube later today. And this is part of a series of webinars that we have run over the past few months on everything from storytelling and virtual reality to whale acoustics and science education outreach. So please check out our YouTube channel on past recorded webinars um, and tune in in two weeks on October 22nd at 2 p.m. for our next webinar on permafrost degradation and impacts of that permafrost thaw with Dr. Kimberly Rain. The uh, event hyperlink uh, will be shared in the email after this uh, after this virtual uh, webinar shared with everyone. So thank you so much to Marcy and I hope to see you all in two weeks at our next webinar. Until then, have a great fall everyone.